In the recent debate between Dr. Slavok Zajek and Dr. Jordan Peterson, the latter provided 10 arguments to refute Marxism. He said that Marx was a narcissist and that the Communist Manifesto was no better than a bad undergraduate level essay. My name is Temur Rahman. I am Associate Professor of Political Science at the Lahore University of Management Sciences in Pakistan. And I am going to try to prove to you that Dr. Peterson attacks Marxism only by presenting a caricature of the complex thoughts of Marx and Engels. I am grateful to Dr. Peterson for putting together all the commonplace objections to Marxism that are found in society and uh, also in the academy. It gives me the opportunity to address them in one go. But I have reorganized his uh, ten arguments into three broad themes. The first is his remarks on class and history, secondly his remarks on capitalism and last but not least his remarks on the dictatorship of the proletariat. Let's begin with his first remarks on class and history. History is to be viewed primarily as an economic class struggle. And I think that's a debatable proposition because there are many other motivations that drive human beings than economics and those have to be taken into account. This is a familiar argument and a familiar charge against Marxism, the charge of economic reductionism. But let's read what Marx had to say in the Communist Manifesto itself. He wrote, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. He didn't say economic class struggles, nor did he say that it's the history only of economic struggles. He follows this up later on in the manifesto by saying, man's ideas, views and conception in one word, man's consciousness changes with every change in the conditions of his material existence, in his social relations and in his social life. As you can see from this quotation, man's ideas are not purely driven or only driven by economic considerations, but by man's material existence and social relations and social life as a whole. That's a much broader category than the category purely of economic relations. The charge of economic reductionism was in fact an argument that was raised during the time of Marx and Engels. And Engels responded to this explicitly in the following passage where he wrote and I quote, According to the materialist conception of history, the ultimately determining element in history is the production and reproduction of real life. Other than this, neither Marx nor I have ever asserted. Hence, if somebody twists this into saying that the economic element is the only determining one, he transforms that proposition into a meaningless, abstract, senseless phrase. It's very clear from this passage, from this letter written in 1890, that Marx and Engels never proposed that economic motivations are the only motivations that explain history or politics. The, this ancient problem of hierarchical structure is clearly not attributable to capitalism because it existed long in human history before capitalism existed and then it predated human history itself. So the question then arises, why would you necessarily, at least implicitly, link the class struggle with capitalism given that it's a far deeper problem? In this particular argument, Dr. Peterson confuses hierarchy and class hierarchy. They are not the same things according to Marx. In fact, Marx is not opposed to all hierarchy, although he is opposed, and Engels too, uh, to class exploitation and to a class hierarchy. Let's first define what I mean by hierarchy. My understanding is that hierarchy is when one person has authority over another. But class, on the other hand, for Marx and Engels, exists only when one section of society exploits another section of society by monopolizing the means of production. In other words, class is not hierarchy and hierarchy is not class. In fact, authority and hierarchy have both existed before the existence of classes and this is well acknowledged in the writings of Marx and Engels. For instance, in The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, Engels speaks about tribal hierarchies, about the sexual division of labor. 
all pertaining to a period of history where classes had not yet emerged. Classes only emerged, according to Marx and Engels, with the Neolithic Revolution, that is the Agricultural Revolution. But society was organized hierarchically even before the emergence of classes. Moreover, Marx and Engels were always of the opinion that even after socialism would come about, there would be hierarchy and there would be authority. For example, in his famous essay on authority, written by Frederick Engels in 1872, he writes, and I quote, wanting to abolish authority in large scale industry is tantamount to wanting to abolish industry itself. Unquote. In other words, what that means is that all industrial societies will have hierarchies, will have authority. Large scale industry, according to Engels and according to Marx, cannot exist without hierarchy, without authority. Engels fo follows that up by saying, and I quote, hence it is absurd to speak of the principle of authority as being absolutely evil and of the principle of autonomy as being absolutely good. So you see here that Marxists are not opposed to hierarchy. They feel that hierarchy has existed in humanity before the existence of classes. It will continue to exist after the existence of classes. It of course also exists during the existence of classes. Karl Marx and Engels, unlike postmodernists and anarchists, are not opposed to all forms of authority or hierarchy. They are only opposed to class exploitation. We're also actually always at odds with nature and this never seems to show up in Marx and it doesn't show up in Marxists, Marxism in general. Hierarchical structures are actually necessary to solve complicated social problems. You may be surprised to discover that in fact that is exactly what Karl Marx also argues in the German ideology which is one of the earliest works he wrote to describe the materialist method. He wrote and I quote the first premise of all human history is of course the existence of living human individuals, that is social being. Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. Very clear, I think. And in this particular reading, Marx argues that humanity enters into hierarchical relations, social relations that are independent of our will and depend more on the kind of society that exists at the time, the, the nature of the struggle against mother nature to provide sustenance to ourselves and subsistence to ourselves. Here again you can see that to charge Marxism with the view that Marx never recognized either the struggle that humanity has to undertake against nature or that hierarchy is necessary in that struggle for nature is really to misread Marxism altogether. Marx also assumes that you can think about history as a binary class struggle with clear divisions between, say, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. But this is not correct. In fact, Marx does not think that in all history there were only two classes. He considers that the fact of existence of two classes is a unique feature only of modern society. Let me quote from the Communist Manifesto. Marx says, in the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeian slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guild masters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs. In almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. Our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinct feature. It has simplified class antagonisms. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. Hence, you see that it was not the case that Marx viewed all of history as being uh, a history driven by two binary classes. Rather, he considers that it is only in capitalism that the complex arrangement of feudal society has been broken down into two big, large antagonistic classes. In his next argument, Dr. Peterson confuses postmodernism and Marxism. It turned out that you could fragment people into multiple identities, and that, that's a fairly easy thing to do, and you could usually find some axis along which they were part of the oppressor class. But for classical Marxism and for Marxists around the world, this definition has never been their operating procedure. Their definition is very clear and that is that 
Class is defined by ownership of the means of production. Doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated. If you do not own the means of production, you are not part of the bourgeoisie. If you do not own capital, you cannot be part of the capitalist class. It's as simple as that. Hence, when Dr. Peterson says that the dekulakization campaign, the collectivization campaign in Russia, encountered enormous violence because the definition of class is so confused, I find that to be an incorrect argument, not for the reason that there wasn't violence during the decollectivization campaign, which assured it, of course, there was, but for the reason that the violence did not owe itself to the fact that classes could not be defined, but rather to the simple fact that the Bolsheviks organized the poor peasants to take over the land of the rich peasants, and the rich peasants didn't want to let go of their land. And you have an implicit idea that all of the good is on the side of the proletariat and all of the evil is on the side of the bourgeoisie. But did Marx really say that? What about Marx's praise of the bourgeoisie within the Communist Manifesto itself? Allow me to quote from the text. The bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie during its rule of scarce 100 years has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. You see here that Marx and Engels are clearly not suggesting that there are no qualities that the bourgeoisie possesses that are redeeming to that class. Not at all. In fact, Quite the opposite, quite the contrary, what they're saying is that they are an incredibly revolutionary class. On the other hand, neither Marx nor Engels argue that the proletariats are all angels. Quite the contrary. In fact, let me quote from the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels say, The dangerous class, lumpen proletariat, the social scum, that passively rotting mass thrown off by the lowest layers of the old society, may here and there be swept into the movement by a proletariat revolution, its conditions of life, however, prepare it far more for the part of a bribed tool of reactionary intrigue." Unquote. You see, in this instance, that Marx and Engels do not consider that the poor, dispossessed, underprivileged are saints and uh, angels who can do no evil. Quite the contrary, they think that they can also be morally corrupted, they can become morally corrupted, they can become the tool of reactionary intrigue and they can do horrible and terrible things. So I feel it is a complete caricature of Marxism to suggest that Marx thinks that the bourgeoisie is only evil and has no redeeming qualities and the proletariat is only good and has no negative qualities. That is quite clearly contradicted by the Communist Manifesto itself. You don't rise to a position of authority that's reliable in a human society primarily by exploiting other people. It's a very unstable means of obtaining power. So, so that's a problem. While it can be true that within the academia, where Dr. Peterson himself works, and I also work, I'm also part of the academia, one rises to the top by, well, producing good research and by influencing people and being a good teacher. It's not the case that that is what happens in the economy as a whole or in civilizations or in history as a whole. I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, I've been to the west coast of Ac Africa, where I went to Senegal, to the Gori Island, where I saw the island from where 13 million people were taken as slaves to work in plantation colonies on the American continent. I can also point out to you the existence of feudalism and how the church owned about a third of the agricultural land of Europe or I can talk about the history of colonialism where you know opium was produced in India and sold to China. The British went to war four times with China for the right to sell opium called the Opium Wars. We can talk about the appropriation of Aztec gold, we can talk about the extermination of Native Americans and so on and so forth. And even if we look at the Roman Empire, we look at the Mughal Empire, we look at all the empires that have existed in history, I don't think that anyone really can deny that it was empires were built on power and on conquest and on exploitation of other people. Even the best of empires were built on those, on, on those foundations, sadly. So while I concede that civilizations rise above other civilizations because of some quality that they have, they nonetheless utilize that quality to also conquer other civilizations, oppress them, and also, sadly, exploit them. Next, I would like to talk about Dr. Peterson's remarks with respect to capitalism. Well, the idea 
from the Marxist perspective was that profit was theft. In fact, Marx never uses that phrase. That phrase, or a similar phrase, was written by Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who said, property is theft. Marx, in fact, argued against Proudhon on the grounds that the concept of theft presumes the concept of property. The purpose, however, of socialist theory was to explain how property comes about. And Proudhon has made a circular argument. That was his critique of Proudhon. So he never accepts the view that property or profit is theft, because that would, in Marx's view, be a circular fallacy. Marx's argument is far more nuanced than that. He says that profit is based on the exploitation of the working class. Profit is not based on theft, but exploitation, which is a distinct concept. And that is that the capitalist class has monopolized the means of production. Hence, the worker must work for the capitalist class to realize their labor. This fact allows the capitalist to employ labor power at a rate that is far less than what labor power is able to produce. Hence, the difference between what a laborer produces and what it costs to produce a laborer is what Marx calls surplus value, which is the basis not just for profit, but also for capitalist interest as well as for capitalist rent. That is Marx's argument, which is very, very different from the view that profit is merely theft. There were forms of stupidity that I couldn't engage in because I would be punished by the market enough to eradicate the enterprise. I agree with this statement. I think that's entirely correct. But what is left out in that argument is that the market only eradicates one kind of stupidity. That is inefficient production. The market doesn't eradicate the stupidity of the misallocation of resources at the macroeconomic level. There are enormous macroeconomic inefficiencies in a given capitalist society. And the reason is that in a world or in a society where, you know, the richest 1% control half the wealth of the world or half the wealth of society, production will inevitably be geared to matching their needs rather than the needs of society as a whole. This is what creates macroeconomic inefficiencies inefficiencies on a macroeconomic scale in capitalism. If your entire market is only about 20% of your society, then your production is geared only for that 20%. Unless you assume, as Marx did, that all of the evil was with the capitalists and all the good was with the proletariats and that nothing that capitalists did constituted valid labor. And the notion that you're adding no productive value as a manager rather than a capitalist is it's absolutely absurd. A very important argument. But the argument, in fact, was refuted by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations nearly 100 years before Marx started writing. Smith argued that profit cannot be wages for managerial work. Why? He proved this that by pointing out that profit is never proportional to the amount of work done by the manager. Profit, rather, is proportional to the amount of capital invested in the first instance. So hence, profit cannot be wages for managerial work. In fact, wages for managerial work are quite distinct from profit, where the investor is not the manager, which is the case in most advanced capitalist firms. The investor doesn't necessarily, the investor hires someone to manage their factory. The investor does not necessarily manage the factory him or herself. And, that inst and even in that instance, the investor retrieves a profit. Hence, that cannot be for managerial purposes, but for other purposes. In fact, when we look at hedge funds and we look at investment banking, if I was super rich, I would hire very smart people to make decisions about where to invest my capital. That's what investment banks do. So I do not even earn money for taking the decisions to invest money. I hire smart people to make those decisions for me. What then? accounts for the profit that I earn if I undertake no work as a manager of a factory. I do not even undertake work deciding where my money is invested. Rather, I hire people to take those decisions for me. And so if your proposition is, look, we got to get as much material security for everyone as, we, as, as possible, as fast as we can, and capitalism already seems to be doing that at a rate that's unparalleled in human history. Wouldn't the logical thing be just to let the damn system play itself out? Sounds like a perfectly reasonable argument. But the problem is that we are not talking about history. We are talking about the future of humanity. We're not talking about the past, but about the future. There is no doubt that 
that in relation to the past, capitalism is a far superior system. In relation to all past systems, slavery, feudalism, the Asiatic mode of production, whatever existed in the past, capitalism is no doubt more productive than all those systems. But the real argument here is not that capitalism is superior to those systems because as you know Marx himself makes that argument and acknowledges that capitalism has created more than all the preceding generations put together. But rather Marx's argument is that socialism is even more productive and better than capitalism. Hence to compare capitalism to past systems is neither here nor there and does not constitute any kind of refutation of Marxism. He says that from 180 to 1800 the global growth rate was 0.5 percent. From 1800 to 2017 income growth adjusted for inflation grew by 40 times by, for production workers and 16 times for unskilled labor. Now the problem with this argument is that once again the data refers to what happened before capitalism came about and compares that to what happened when capitalism did emerge. But no one has made the argument that capitalism is inferior to feudalism or slave society and so on. Hence the data presented is absolutely insignificant because Marx himself accepts this argument and accepts this data. And there's going to be a race to the bottom of wages for the workers as the capitalists strive to extract more and more um, value from the labor of the proletariat. This was referred to in the time of Karl Marx as the iron law of wages. And Marx explicitly refuted this argument in his book Wage, Labor and Capital. He says, and I quote, if capital grows rapidly, wages may rise, but the profit of capital rises disproportionately faster. The material position of the worker has improved, but at the cost of his social position. The social chasm that separates him from the capitalist has widened. So you see that Marx's argument is not that the evil capitalists are going to monopolize all the flat screen TVs. His argument rather is that the top 1% will control a greater and greater proportion of the wealth generated by society. Global inequality will continue to rise. And this was proven true by the phenomenal study done by Thomas Piketty in his book Capital in the 21st Century where he makes the argument that R is always greater than G. That is, the rate of return on capital is greater than real income growth. Profits increase faster than the increase in the economy as a whole and this contributes to increasing inequality within any free market society. So here's an example. The UN millennial, one of the UN millennial goals to, was to reduce the, the rate of absolute poverty in the world by 50% between 2000 and 2015. And they defined that as $1.90 a day. Pretty low, you know, uh, but you have to start somewhere. Um, we, be, we, we hit that at 2012, three years ahead of schedule. The bloody UN thinks that we'll be out of poverty defined by $1.90 a day by the year 2030. Now the problem with this data is that 70% of global poverty reduction has been undertaken by the People's Republic of China that lifted 700 million people out of poverty in the last four decades alone. This is arguably the greatest economic achievement in human history. But it doesn't help Dr. Peterson's point of view that this great achievement in human history in terms of poverty reduction has been undertaken by a regime that calls itself communist and that subscribes to the Marxist ideology. I will however concede that between 1981 and 2013 even poverty amongst those who were non-Chinese has gone down absolute and extreme poverty from 29 percent to 12 percent and this is no doubt a significant achievement. But let's not over celebrate this achievement because in Africa as a whole poverty has actually gone up and in sub-Saharan Africa particularly extreme poverty is on the increase. It is not decreasing in those countries and in fact the proportion of people who are in poverty in Africa as a, a proportion of global poverty has been going up in the last two three decades. So Dr. Peterson also points out that the child mortality rate in Africa is the same as the child mortality rate in Europe in 1952. I find the statistic quite appalling because what it takes to lift uh, the child mortality rate in any given society is actually very little. The results in so far as Africa certainly are concerned do not in any way shape or form favor free market reforms. The first thing I'd like to say is we do not know how to set up a human system of economics without inequality. No one has ever managed it including the communists. Very true.
But communists don't aim to create a system without inequality. Karl Marx and Engels in their famous work The Critique of Gotha Program in fact directly address this question. Instead of the indefinite concluding phrase of the paragraph the elimination of all social and political inequality, it ought to have been said that with the abolition of class distinctions all social and political inequality arising from them would disappear of itself. In other words, Karl Marx and Engels do not intend to do away with all forms of inequality, but only with the form of inequality that arises from class exploitation. And again, this is made very explicitly clear and obvious in the phrase from each according to his ability to each according to his work, which is the phrase that was used by nearly all socialist governments, even governments that are not socialist. For example, that phrase is present in the constitution of Pakistan itself. The phrase implies, of course, that those who work harder will make more money, those who have more skilled labor will make more money. This was referred to as bourgeois right by Karl Marx and Marx and Engels both thought that bourgeois right would continue to exist in the lower stages, in the early stages of communism. And it's not obvious by any stretch of imagination that the free market economies of the West have more inequality than the less free economies in the rest of the world. I don't like this phrase free market versus less free economies. The reason I don't like this dichotomy is because less free market or less free economies includes also pre-capitalist societies. It includes feudal societies or societies where there is indentured labor or where there is where there are other forms of bondage and naturally those societies that are semi-feudal or uh, practice other forms of indentured or unfree labor will never grow as fast as any capitalist society because those are outdated anachronistic modes of production. So when you make this these two categories of free market societies and unfree societies in this particular category you are also including many many societies that are pre-capitalist and that is an unfair comparison. Rather the real comparison that ought to be made is between free market economies and societies in which there is let's say state intervention, where there is socialism etc. And we have one such very important society and that is of course the former Soviet Union. In the former Soviet Union, before 1991, you had a massive state sector, you had almost no private capital and then after 1991, you had private ownership of the means of production, you had a free market economy, you had freely floating uh, prices and so on. And what happened to inequality in the former Soviet Union? Let's just have a look. You can see that during the period that socialism existed, the inequality in Russia was lower than inequality in France, the United Kingdom or the United States of America. But after 1991, when the free market was restored, inequality jumps to a level which is as high, if not higher, than the inequality in advanced capitalist countries. This clearly indicates that where capitalism is restored, in economic inequality inevitably follows. And the one thing you can say about capitalism is that although it produces inequality, which it absolutely does, it also produces wealth and all the other systems don't. They just produce inequality. Now this is a classic neoliberal mantra. You can either have growth, high growth with lots of inequality or you can have equality but then you'll have low growth. But the economic data suggests something very different. For example, the Soviet Union industrialized extremely rapidly, so rapidly in fact that they managed to outproduce and defeat the combined force of fascist Europe in World War II. They led the race into space and after becoming a free market economy, the Russian economy has been pretty much a disaster. In China also you achieved high levels of growth while simultaneously lifting millions of people out of poverty, you can have growth with equity. The other example, of course, are Nordic countries or, or welfare states where you have very good growth, very high rates of growth together with societies that have and practice a high degree of economic equality. Last but not least, I would like to address Dr. Peterson's remarks on the dictatorship of the proletariat. Let me first explain what Marx means by the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat. To begin with, for Karl Marx, all states from the dawn of the existence of states till the most recent states that we see in history, including the states that practice free and fair elections, that uphold human rights, that uphold freedom of the press, etc. All states are essentially class dictatorships. The reason why Marx says that they are class dictatorships 
even states that practice elections, is because, he says, the ruling class owns the means of production and by virtue of owning the means of production, the ruling class is able to dominate not just economically, but it is also able to dominate intellectually, it is able to dominate politically, it is able to dominate culturally over all the other classes of society. Hence, states by definition are dictatorships, either of the feudal class or of the capitalist class or of the working class or of some other class, but they are by definition dictatorships of the class that owns the means of production, that owns economic resources. Whoever owns economic resources really runs society. That's Marx's point. Now, Dr. Peterson says that Marxism would end up replacing the capitalist class with a, quote, minority of proletariats. You can replace the capitalist class with a minority of pro proletariats. But this concept is explicitly refuted by Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto. Marx does not consider the dictatorship of the proletariat to be the rule of a minority. In fact, he considers it exactly the opposite, the rule of the majority of people, that is, the working class against the exploiting minority that is the capitalist class. So for Karl Marx the dictatorship of the proletariat was the realization of the principles of a democratic republic. Sounds ironic I know because we use the term dictatorship in a very different context but Marx meant it in a very different way and we need to recognize that in order to not make a scarecrow or misrepresent Marx's argument. Marx writes in the Communist Manifesto, all previous historical movements were movements of minorities or in the interests of minorities. The proletariat movement is the self-conscious independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. So clearly you can see over here that Marx does not consider that the proletariat movement would place a minority of people in the same position as capitalism. He continues by saying the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class, to win the battle of democracy. You can see that for Marx, democracy begins when the working class takes power. You can compare this to the concept of the democratization of the economy. Real democracy will only begin when the means of production, when economic resources are controlled not by a small tiny elite, but by the people themselves. That's when you get real democracy according to Karl Marx. And when you give, put people in the same position as the evil capitalists, especially if you believe that social pressure is one of the determining factors of human character, which the Marxists certainly believe, then why wouldn't you assume that the proletariat would immediately become as or more corrupt than the capitalists? Karl Marx does not suggest uh, that proletarians ought to be put in the same position as capitalists. Yes, of course, if proletariats, poor people, are put in the same position as capitalists, they would become just like capitalists. Maybe they would be as corrupt, maybe they wouldn't. But that's not Marx's proposition in any case. Marx doesn't want to make proletariats into capitalists. He wants to destroy capitalism itself. And he says that the proletariat, in fact, as a class, cannot liberate itself without destroying capitalism. Yes, individual proletariats may rise into the middle class, some may even rise into the capitalist class, but the proletariat as a class cannot liberate itself without destroying capitalism itself. He says, and I quote, the proletariat, the lowest stratum of our present society, cannot stir, cannot raise itself up without the whole superincumbent strata of official society being sprung into the air. Very clear, it seems, that Marx thinks that the proletariat can only liberate itself by destroying the economic foundations of capitalism and the entire superstructure of capitalism. Therefore, there is no question in Karl Marx of placing proletariats, quote, in the same position as capitalists. Dictatorship of the proletariat, which involves absurd centralization, the overwhelming probability of corruption, and impossible computation, as the proletariat now try to rationally compute the manner in which an entire market economy could run, which cannot be done because it's far too complicated for anybody to think through. I won't suggest that Dr. Peterson is making the argument that working class people are too dumb to run government, but I will say that capitalism has already placed complex decision making power in the hands of a tiny elite, very, very few people. Do consider that in the world today, 26 people, 26 of the richest people in the world own as much wealth as the poorest 50%. Is that not a ridiculous degree of centralization, I ask you?
Very small groups of people take decisions that impact millions of people and the lives of millions of people. All that socialism is demanding is that these decisions are made by the people themselves and are made in the interests of the people themselves. For Karl Marx, the dictatorship of the proletariat isn't based on mere centralization. It is based on the concept of democratic centralization. That means that people delegate their power to their elected representatives through a democratic process. It is centralism, it is centralization, but achieved on the basis of the principle of democracy. And this was made very clear in Marx's work titled The Civil War in France, where he examined the Paris Commune of 1871. This is the first time in the history of humanity when proletariats, industrial workers took power. Marx examined the form and structure of the state that they created, referring to it as the dictatorship of the proletariat. And he talks about how the rule of the proletariat, the working class, would establish a real democratic republic. He wrote, and I quote, the direct antithesis to the empire was the commune. What were the features of the Paris Commune? Let me read them out to you as quickly as I can. Firstly, suppression of the standing army and the substitution for it of the armed people. The Commune was formed of the municipal councillors chosen by universal suffrage in various wards of the town responsible and revocable at short terms. The majority of its members were naturally working men or acknowledged representatives of the working class. The Commune was to be a working, not a parliamentary body, executive and legislative at the same time. The police was at once stripped of its political attributes and turned into the responsible and at all times revocable agent of the Commune. So were the officials of all of the branches of the administration. From the members of the commune downwards, the public service had to be done at working men's wage. Public function ceased to be the private property of the tools of the central government. Not only municipal administration, but the whole initiative hitherto exercised by the state was laid into the hands of the commune. The commune was anxious to break the spiritual force of repression, the past and power by the disestablishment and the disendowment of all churches as proprietary bodies. The priests were sent back to the recesses of private life. Educational institutions were opened to the people gratuitously and at the same time cleared of all interference of church and state. Thus, not only was education made accessible to all, but science itself freed from the fetters which class prejudice and governmental force had imposed upon it. Magistrates and judges were to be elective, responsible and revocable. The rural communities of every district were to administer their common affairs by an assembly of delegates in the central town and these district assemblies were again to send deputies to the national delegation in Paris each delegate to be at any time revocable and bound by the mandate imperative that is the formal instructions of his constituents the few but important functions which would still remain for a central government were not to be suppressed as has been intentionally misstated but were to be discharged by communal and therefore responsible agents universal suffrage was to serve the people constituted in communes as individual suffrage serves every employer in the search for the workmen and managers in his business now when you examine examine these points regarding the dictatorship of the proletariat, you cannot but come to the conclusion that for Karl Marx, the dictatorship of the proletariat could only be established by the quantitative and qualitative extension of the principle of democracy into all branches of human life. That is where you have complete democracy, where people not only control decisions with respect to politics, but have the ability to control decisions with respect to how economic resources are going to be utilized by society, that is the dictatorship of the proletariat, that is the realization of the principles of a democratic republic. And it is only when the dictatorship of the proletariat is able to exercise these principles of democracy elaborated by Karl Marx that they can ensure that there are necessary checks and balances within the state to prohibit the abuse of authority. Where socialist states have failed to create the necessary democratic institutions to check abuse of authority, there of course corruption will and did thrive. Democracy is absolutely essential to the dictatorship of the proletariat according to the theory of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. The next theory is that somehow the proletariat dictatorship would become magically hyperproductive. And there's actually no theory 
at all about how that's going to happen. Well, the answer was right there in the Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx has 10 points about what working people should do if they took state power. Let me go through them quickly. Firstly, Marx calls for the abolition of property in land and the application of all rents of land to public purposes. Secondly, he calls for a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, the abolition of all rights of inheritance, confiscation of the property of all emigrants and rebels, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan, equal liability of all work, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of all distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the populace over the country, free education for all children in public schools, abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, etc, etc. As you can see, John Peterson is not right when he says that Marx does not talk about how socialism would be more productive than capitalism. He does. We can disagree with what he has to say about it, but I think we cannot make the argument that he doesn't suggest anything at all. He makes the suggestion right there in the Communist Manifesto. Many of these points, in fact, have been taken up by governments that are not even socialist. Uh, for example, free education for all citizens and free health care for all citizens, etc. These are arguments that are largely now accepted by many people in European countries, though not so much in the United States of America, but they are accepted by most European states. But there is another reason why a socialist society can be more productive at the macroeconomic level than a capitalist society. What makes a society grow economically is the development and application of new technology. So that means that in any industrial society, not only does that society have to raise the rate of savings and reinvestment, but that reinvestment must occur in those branches of industry that yield positive externalities as far as technology is concerned. In other words, they lead to the growth and development and application of technology. Dostoevsky's idea was that, you know, we were built for trouble. And if we were ever handed everything we, were, we needed on a silver platter, the first thing we would do is engage in some form of creative destruction just so something unexpected could happen, just so we could have the adventure of our lives. What I find problematic about this argument is that by implication, it depicts socialism as a society free of all conflict where everyone will be absolutely happy, peaceful and so on. But socialism, according to Marx and Engels, is not a utopia. In their famous work, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, Marx wanted to separate his ideas. Marx and Engels wanted to separate their ideas from utopian socialists. Who are the utopian socialists and why did Marx and Engels criticize them? Utopian socialists thought of socialism as the implementation of an a priori moral principle or an a priori rational principle. They thought that socialism would create a perfectly ordered society that would be peaceful, that would be free of all forms of conflict. For Marx and Engels, the argument for socialism was based purely on an examination of the contradictions of capitalism. Socialism, in their view, was merely the next stage in human development. It wasn't a perfect society. It wasn't a flawless society. It wasn't a society without inequality. It wasn't a society without hierarchy. It wasn't supposed to be a society without any form of violence or conflict or problems or a perfectly happy utopia. That is not the conception of socialism that Marx and Engels have at all. It is true, however, I do concede that Marxists have argued that the violence caused by capitalism or by capitalist exploitation will come to an end, leading to a significant reduction in global violence as well as violence within a society. It will lead to a reduction in global violence because militarism is incentivized in the modern world by the thirst to monopolize, capture raw materials and labor markets. This is what led to World War I and World War II and so on. So Marxists do argue that um, with the destruction of capitalism, the incentive for militarization will significantly decrease. Moreover, Marxists are also of the opinion that 
if you have a high degree of inequality in any given society, a high degree of class inequality in any given society, you tend to find that those societies have greater levels of street violence and petty crime. If you have greater societies, you have better developed welfare states, you have a lower degree of street crime. And I think economic statistics also demonstrate that societies that have a highly developed welfare state, for example, Canada or uh, Sweden or Norway, etc., their street crime, etc., is extremely low. But where you have a very high degree of inequality, say the United States of America, their street crime, gun crime, deaths by violent gun incidents are actually much, much higher. And remember, this is a call for revolution, and not just revolution, but bloody violent revolution. But for Marx and Engels, a peaceful resolution of capitalism was in fact desirable. Engels wrote about this specifically in the essay, Principles of Communism. Engels asks, will the peaceful abolition of private property be possible? He answers by saying it would be desirable if this could happen and the communists would certainly be the last to oppose it. It is only in the instance where violence is used to suppress the struggle for the emancipation of the working class that violence on the part of working people to emancipate themselves can be justified. Last but certainly not least, I would like to say that uh, I have been following Dr. Peterson's online lectures for about a year now and uh, I found many of them to be quite stimulating, intellectually stimulating. Even where I've disagreed with them, I found them to at least question many of my assumptions and as an academic I can't help but appreciate that. I also find him to be a compassionate person. I watched many of his videos with respect to his uh, daughter, uh, you know, some of the medical conditions that uh, she suffered and how he dealt with it as a father and how they dealt with it as a family and I was myself quite touched by those videos being myself a, a father of two girls and so I believe that um, uh, uh, whatever his arguments may be and I find his arguments to be uh, you know a gross distortion and misrepresentation a caricature of Marxism a straw man that he's built uh, you know to attack Marxism be that as it may I do believe that we share some fundamental values values of, of justice and compassion and so on that basis I invite not only Dr. Peterson but also his followers to revisit and review their understanding of Marxism, to deepen their understanding of the nuances of Marxism. Marxism is not making an argument against hierarchy per se or against authority per se. It is not making the argument that the rich are getting richer while the poor are getting poorer. It is making the argument that in a free market society the, the distance, the social gap, the relative gap between the rich and the poor will continue to increase. So while the poor do get better off than they were previously, the rich are disproportionately better off and what that implies about any given society, uh, the culture of that society, the development of elitism in that society, the development of democracy in that society, obviously uh, where the social chasm between the working class, uh, between the employees and the employers continues to grow. There I believe that there will also be many many questions of social justice, democracy uh, and questions uh, uh, of the future development of those societies. And I think these are the main things pointed out by Karl Marx. A compassion for the poor. I myself come from a class of people within the context of Pakistan that can be considered part of the bourgeoisie. When I read Marxism, I could not help but feel a new and stronger sense of compassion for the poor, for the working class. And I've spent, um, well, about um, two and a half decades of my life uh, with trade unions and working class organizations and with the left political party in Pakistan uh, precisely because I recognize that the free market economy not only creates gross inequity but that that inequity is based on the exploitation of the working people.